it's uh, such a great honor, of course, for me to, uh, I'm going to go up on stage, if it's okay with you. It's, uh, it's a great honor for me to be here with you this evening. Ah, okay. Is it on? Okay. So it's a great honor for me to be here this evening with you to uh, actually the way it's kind of the homecoming. Uh, I left uh, Pondicherry in uh, 1989, so it has been almost like a long journey. Uh, it's come, coming now full circle, so delighted to be back here this evening uh, and uh, to talk about a subject that I'm very, very passionate about, which is actually uh, full moderation. Uh, before I go any further into this, I want you to kind of look at these two words next to each other. You don't see them together often. Think about, for example, the iPhone. It costs around $600. Probably in the next generation iPhones, it's gonna cost about $1,000. So something so innovative cannot be frugal, right? So you always think about innovation, and you never think about that being frugal. And similarly, when you think about innovation, you think about big R&D labs. You think billion dollar you know, R&D budgets sunk into coming up with the next big thing. So innovation itself is not something you think as being frugal. So that means something innovative cannot be frugal, and it's not possible to frugally do anything innovative, right? So these are the two words that actually sound almost like an oxymoron, a contradiction de temps. But by the end of the talk, hopefully, I want you to help reconcile these two words and explain how it's possible to use this as a new paradigm to actually not just come up with better tools or better technologies, but actually to co-build a better world with fewer resources. So that is kind of the context for our discussion today. So but I thought, like in India, we always, even though I live in America, we always look at what's coming next, but I thought it's kind of important to take some time to go back in history and in time to really trace the origin, the genesis of this concept, which is now you know, becoming very popular in the Western world, which was born here in India. So I thought it's important to kind of uh, point to the genesis of this concept, which way kind of coincides with my own background. Uh, I grew up in the 70s uh, in Pondicherry, right here. And I still remember with the Hari, my brother who is here, and other brothers, uh, sometime we wake up in the morning, early in the morning. Uh, this was a very dry climate, as you know, and uh, water was rationed. And uh, we have to fill these uh, buckets with water. And uh, occasionally, several times a week, we had the luxury of taking what we call a one bucket shower. Um, so I learned very early on about the importance of you know, managing scarce resources like water. But I also had this pleasure to, of course, attend the French high school, Lycée Français here. But when I was six, seven, somehow, uh, before I met Maurice Shukla, my uh, esteemed English teacher who is here, who literally like, you know, got me addicted to the English language, uh, somehow, you know, spirit something, some higher force got me interested in English. But this was, remember, the 70s, and uh, at that time there was no internet. And uh, this is before 1991, when the economy got liberalized. So it wasn't easy to get access to English books and magazines. But thankfully, near my house in St. Therese was this old man who used to rent, actually, for a few rupees, these old magazines, Time, Newsweek, and old books as well, for a few rupees. And uh, this allowed me, essentially, to learn English a bit faster, I guess, than my fellow student beings, my fellow students. And, uh, and this is something that actually also in India we practice widely. Uh, which is the fact that you never waste any resource. Uh, as a matter of fact, Dr. Marshall Carr, who is a famous scientist, says this is the only country in the world where we even fix and repair a plastic bucket. Right? <laughs> Probably this is the only country in the world we do that. So nothing gets wasted. Everything is reused and transformed. And of course, this has been practiced in this culture for a very long time. And this goes by a very fancy term in the West now called the circular economy. In the West, we always put a label on things that are common sense in developing countries. Uh, so now it's called the circular economy, and we'll talk about that you know, in a few minutes. So after experiencing extreme scarcity living in you know, a developing country like India, I probably got tired of scarcity, and I said I want to discover abundance. So I decided to go to the West, uh, went to study in France for seven years before immigrating to the United States in 1998 and I'm now settled in Silicon Valley, where innovation is considered really sexy and really cool. And it is true, when you look at, for example, the spacecraft, the Maven, launched by NASA, that entered Mars orbit in September 2015, it's an amazing kind of scientific feat, something which is very inspiring, right? And uh, at the same time, this kind of uh, cool innovation doesn't come cheap. 
as a matter of fact, this spacecraft cost $670 million of taxpayers, like me, American citizens' money, to send this you know, spacecraft into uh, orbit uh, in Mars. And so we discovered that actually that as we study more and more how people go about companies, actually organizations, in the West go about innovating, what we discovered is, is that actually since World War II, there has been like an arms race. That means that Western countries have tried to outstand each other in terms of R&D expenditure. The, the kind of assumption, the belief was that the more we invest in R&D, research and development, we are going to somehow magically you know, create more innovative solutions. And now we see that even Asia, led particularly by China, is entering this you know, R&D arms race as well. To the point where in 2015 alone, it has been estimated that some of the largest companies spent a whopping $680 billion in R&D. The question is, what's wrong with this you know, picture? What's wrong with the picture is that for a long time, nobody debated this assumption that more R&D leads to more innovation. But in the last 10 years, there's been a steady stream of research that shows actually that there's no correlation between how much money you invest in R&D and how much innovation you generate. Because there are so many different factors you know, that take, you know, have to be you know, taken into account to convert R&D investments into innovation. So in other words, to put it succinctly, money does not buy innovation. And yet, we have been following this kind of you know, assumption for the last you know, 60, 70 years. And uh, so we also notice living in Silicon Valley like I do, that when you have too much money, what happens is that either you try to be very safe, so you are very risk averse, you don't take too many risks, so you produce products and services that are not radically different than what's in the marketplace because you don't want to take a big risk and come up with something which is radically new, or sometimes you produce useless stuff. So Silicon Valley is a champion of that. Like for example, we have developed this uh, 600, $700 uh, juice machine, which is supposedly Wi-Fi connected to justify the high price tag. Uh, and it turns out, uh, according to a media report, that it is no, no, no more effective than what I use every morning, which is a manual juicer, which costs only $1. Okay? So this is the kind of aberration going on in Silicon Valley, where we keep investing more in R&D to get less in terms of innovation. And this aberration actually led Sam Petroda, who many of you know, uh, to say that some of the world's best brains are busy solving the problems of the rich who really don't have problems. And uh, actually, there are problems, right? What are those problems? Well, how about 17 out there? These are actually the 17 sustainable development goals uh, established by United Nations. Uh, these are essentially big ticket problems, I call them. Big issues facing humanity as a whole, right? Things like access to sanitation, access to clean energy, gender equality, uh, access to good healthcare services, etc. So we need to essentially use all the innovation talent here around the world to actually address these crucial issues as opposed to coming up in you know, a Wi-Fi connected you know, uh, juicer or a tea maker, which also happened in Silicon Valley recently, and those companies, both of them, went bankrupt. Um, so after spending almost 20 years of my lifetime living in the West, the land of the plenty, I realized that that's not the place where you're going to find these you know, creative solutions to tackle you know, these global issues that I described. So me and my co-authors decided to go back to roots, basically go back to the environment of scarcity where we grew up in the South, and understand how innovators and entrepreneurs go about innovating with very few resources. And what we discovered is that actually they have a very unique mindset, the innovators in developing nations. And this mindset can be described in contrast with uh, Silicon Valley. So in Silicon Valley, an engineer comes Monday morning to work asking himself or herself the question, which is, what if I can create a fridge that talks to my smartphone? Makes sense. All of us, we have a fridge at home, and we have a, you know, a smartphone. And if I run out of milk, I could receive a SMS on the way back home, so I can get a liter of milk on the way home, which sounds very interesting. But this is what I call small what if question. Because someone in India asked himself a more fundamental big what if question, which is what if I can develop a fridge that consumes electricity? Which is you know, a very important question because until recently it's still the case, right? Uh, many parts of India that are not completely connected to electric grid or are connected to an unreliable kind of electric system. 
And this question wasn't asked by someone who has a PhD or an MBA from a top school, but by Mansu Prachapati, who is a porter by training. He didn't even finish high school. But he actually used what he knows, which is pottery as a skill, to create this uh, fridge called Mithikul, which is, I think, the world's greenest fridge, made entirely of clay. And uh, it doesn't consume any electricity. And it's 100% biodegradable. And essentially uses what we call the principle of evaporation to retain the you know, heat, absorb the heat inside, and retain the humidity in the inside chambers. Uh, thus keeping fruits and vegetables fresh for five days and milk fresh for a couple of days. So the first observation is that when you place a limitation on resources, you remove the limitation on creativity. In other words, what we consider as a constraint becomes actually a spur for innovation and creativity. So this ability to, as an alchemist, transmute adversity into an opportunity, we see that across other emerging markets as well. Like, for example, in uh, Peru, a country that faces, uh, you know, they have about 90% humidity rate, like here, and they only receive uh, one inch of rainfall every year. And uh, so the local engineering college in Lima, the capital, uh, developed this uh, giant advertising billboard that actually absorbs the humidity in the air, condenses it, purifies it, and generates over 90 liters of drinkable water. Okay? So literally out of thin air, they're able to you know, create fresh water. And uh, I just read last week that there is actually a startup in Israel which has also created a similar solution but a much more larger scale. And now I think they, want, they have, I think they have an office in uh, northern part of India to actually you know, deploy that kind of solution in India as well, which is a, you know, also a tropical kind of climate. Um, and we see similar thing in China as well. For example, the fact that in China, there are uh, 500 million people uh, who are going to become elderly citizens, senior citizens by 2050. And many of them live in rural areas where they have you know, not good access to healthcare services because they face uh, chronic diseases. As you know, there's a rivalry between India and China to become the world capital for diabetes and chronic diseases. Unfortunately, it's not a, a sad competition to have, but many of these uh, elderly people live in rural areas. So when you, know, when you get sick, what do you do, right? You can go all the way to a you know, city, it's gonna be hundreds of miles. So when the patient cannot go to the doctor, the doctor has to find a way to come to patient, right? So this is a solution, a formal solution, where they develop these uh, easy to use uh, medical devices that can be operated by nurses or community workers, and uh, they can go to different villages, collect you know, vital signs from elderly people, all the data goes into a cloud computing in the server up there in the cloud. And then it's analyzed using algorithms and can prescribe an initial kind of uh, diagnosis. Sorry, do a first initial diagnosis. And then the doctor, you know, when it's serious, can actually look at it remotely in the city and then offer a personalized treatment plan to the patient. So this is the kind of solution that China is trying to do, which is essentially to uh, face the, you know, the issue that they can't quickly enough build hospitals or train doctors as they're facing this uh, ticking demographic time bomb. And, uh, and of course, you know, when I present you know, these examples that I presented until 2015, I used to present, I wrote a whole book on these things, uh, you know, these frugal solutions coming from emerging markets in the West, uh, they will always say, yeah, but this is all nice, but we send a man to the moon. Can you do that you know, in a frugal way? Well, we did prove that, right, in 2015, uh, when uh, Mongolian, which was a spacecraft developed by uh, ISRO, the Indian Space Agency, actually entered Mars orbit, same time as NASA's Maven, as you know, except that uh, this solution was developed only for a cost of $74 million, which is uh, one-tenth of the budget of NASA. As a matter of fact, the entire annual budget of ISRO is the equivalent of one-day you know, expenditure of NASA. And uh, so it's also interesting because uh, Hollywood made a movie, Gravity, with uh, George Clooney and Sandra Bullock for a budget of $100 million. So while Hollywood explores space in fiction, India does that in reality cheaper. Okay. And, and next year, as you know, there's going to be a mission to do a moon landing as well. So I think they're going to extend this, what we call frugal engineering or frugal science to other explorations in coming years. Um, so when we look at all these examples that I described so far, uh, our interest was to essentially figure out 
what is the kind of mindset, what is the kind of uh, spirit of these entrepreneurs who are able to essentially, to, as I say, transmute adversity into opportunity, do more with less, how to do that? Well, they have a very interesting perspective, right? It's something that I call perspective, which is a certain bold view that says that when you face scarcity, don't get intimidated by that. Rather, use abundance to overcome scarcity. That sounds like a contradiction, isn't it? Wait a second, now you're saying that they're facing scarcity, but how can you experience abundance? So here I thought I would use this, uh, you know, this uh, glass half empty, half full, because I happen to be a French citizen as well. And I think that, uh, not I think, I always say that the national sport in France is not football, soccer, but supplant. They complain all the time. That is national sport. They always complain. Right? And they complain because that means we have a perspective that says the glass is always half empty. Right? But it turns out that for the entrepreneurs in emerging markets, they acknowledge that the glass is indeed half empty. They know, objectively speaking, they do face a scarcity of tangible resources like water, capital, energy. But when the external resources are scarce, they're able to go within themselves to tap into abundant resources that exist within oneself. And these resources could be human you know, qualities like uh, ingenuity, empathy, resilience at the individual level. But at the societal level, it could also be the traditional knowledge. In India, for example, we have amazing ancestral knowledge to build houses with mud, for example, or the traditional knowledge in terms of healthcare with Ayurveda. So it's about actually leveraging what we already have, including our biodiversity, to actually overcome the scarcity of what we don't have. So that's what I mean by using what is abundant, often within us, as an individual or as a society, to overcome the scarcity of these more tangible resources. But you can push it even further and say, wait a second, you can also think about, in that case, how about using existing technologies, because in Silicon Valley, right, it's always about how do we develop the next big thing, but sometimes it's worth thinking how do we make use of existing technologies to come up with new solutions, right? And uh, there is one continent, I think, that is teaching us on a large scale how to do this idea of, you know, leveraging existing technologies, to transcend the limitations uh, of what infrastructure they have is uh, Africa. Africa is a continent of extremes because on the one hand, 80% Africans uh, don't have electricity, they don't have a bank account, but 80% uh, Africans have mobile phone. So they're actually using the abundance of mobile connectivity to overcome the scarcity of these basic services, whether it's finance or energy, for example. So this is the case, for example, in uh, Kenya, a country that uh, has uh, half the population now using the solution called M-Pesa, which enables uh, the citizens to send, receive money using their mobile phone without having a bank account. That's important, without having a bank account. So that actually shows that today, actually, I believe that 50% of the country's GDP is actually transacted to the system. So this is a continent that is kind of leapfrogging in a way, you know, from no banking straight to mobile banking. And that's the starting point. Because once you have this kind of uh, electronic money, you can use it not just buy frivolous stuff on Flipkart or Amazon, uh, but actually to buy basic services, like electricity, for example. Right? And here again, there's an amazing innovation happening in Kenya with something called Mkopa, which enables uh, citizens to uh, have access to clean electricity, solar energy, on a pay-as-you-go basis. That means that as, as, as long as every day you make a micropayment using a mobile phone of a few rupees every day, you have access to the system which remains unlocked. And then after 365 micropayments a year later, the system is unlocked permanently and you have access to free clean electricity. Okay? And uh, this is why when Obama went to Kenya, his father's homeland, we made it a point to visit you know, this, uh, this uh, solution. Um, and again, we show that you know, how Africa is also kind of leapfrogging from, I call it candlelight, straight to solar light. Okay? Um, so we wrote these, uh, this book called Jugad Innovation uh, about five years ago to actually document these uh, amazing you know, engineer solutions in uh, resource-constrained kind of uh, environments like India and also to celebrate you know, this uh, improvisational skill that we have so that in the face of adversity, we don't shy away from it, but actually we look at, as, you know, as I said, as a kind of an alchemist, how do we transcend and include adversity to create you know, new value out of that. 
And, uh, and of course, if there's a character that uh, embodies the spirit of Dugat, I'm from, I'm showing, up, showing my age here, but uh, in the 80s, uh, my favorite hero was uh, MacGyver. Uh, how many of you know about MacGyver? Just curious. Okay. So thank God, I feel good. <laughs> because I was uh, doing lectures at uh, Cornish Engineering College and uh, PU with a lot of 20s. And I asked the question, no one raised their hand. So I felt really like, okay, I'm getting old here. So I need to come up with uh, you know, another, another, another character now. So MacGyver, unlike, uh, so you know, unlike uh, James Bond, he doesn't wear a suit. Uh, he wears jeans, a very informal guy. And also, uh, when he gets trapped, you know, he gets you know, thrown into prison or somewhere in a difficult situation, unlike James Bond, he doesn't have fancy gadgets. Right? Actually, he uses things like you know, a Swiss Army knife which, or duct tape, anything he can find around him. So he's very resourceful with what he has around him. And this is the kind of uh, Jugad or MacGyver spirit when I present in the Western world, I always compare this you know, with the MacGyver spirit. They kind of understand immediately you know, what we are talking about when I say Jugad. Um, what I want to do now is a transition to the next section of my uh, presentation to explain that this concept of Jugad now, as I said, is now gaining more traction in the US and Europe. Uh, and uh, in those parts of the world, it's being called full innovation. Because it turns out that even though there's a lot of ingenuity, resourcefulness, resilience that go into Juga, I think the element that uh, primarily in the Western world has become more interesting for researchers and practitioners is the notion of frugality, right? How do we actually you know, kind of uh, come up with solutions that are affordable without compromising on quality? And uh, so I thought it's important to kind of formally introduce uh, what we mean by full innovation and identify some of these you know, uh, core principles. So in a nutshell, what we mean by full innovation is actually the ability to do more with less. That is essentially try to create more value, but at the same time trying to minimize resources. So that sounds kind of more like kind of a, almost like a capitalistic kind of you know, uh, phrase, right? Do more with less, it sounds like a, a trying to optimize the system to extract more efficiency from the system, right? It is true, actually it started that way. And, uh, but me and my uh, co-authors, we try to kind of show that it actually is becoming a new way of innovating, as a matter of fact. So more and more companies, as I said earlier, right? We never think frugal innovation in the same sentence. And I've consulted 20 years with large companies, and uh, it's very difficult for them to think that frugal can go with innovation, because most of them spend billions of dollars in R&D projects. But uh, in the case of Carlos Ghosn, who is the CEO of Renault Nissan, as you know, the car company, the joint venture between Renault and Nissan, they had this uh, very interesting insight, uh, he had a very interesting insight, because when he came in 2006 to India, uh, he actually discovered that the Indian engineers, compared to the French engineers, when faced with the same technical problem, were able to create a solution that is you know, sometimes 10x cheaper uh, without compromising in quality, and often develop the solution much faster. Uh, so he coined this term called frugal engineering. So he's the one who coined it in 2006, and uh, they actually used the frugal engineering approach uh, to come up with a, a very affordable car in 2005 called the Logan uh, for a price point of uh, $6,000. Um, initially, it was developed for emerging markets, developing nations. And to their surprise, uh, this became a big hit in Western Europe. And uh, after that, they started actually creating a whole range of products targeted to those people who actually who can afford these premium you know, kind of cars. And today, these products account for 40% of the revenues of this company. And after developing this car, of course, they uh, realized that this wasn't enough because in emerging markets, this is still a very you know, high price point. So they asked Gerard de Toube, who actually was the head of engineering, uh, responsible for this uh, you know, Logan car project, to actually go live uh, in India, uh, in this case in Chennai, so we can actually empathize with the kind of uh, traffic jams that we're confronted with. Uh, but also the kind of uh, beautiful potholes that you know we find in our you know nice streets in India, right? So so that basically you start developing more empathy for the you know drivers in India, and how do you come up with a, you know with a vehicle who actually can withstand the kind of you know uh, uh, quality of roads that we have here? And uh, this resulted, of course, in creating a whole new uh, car platform, a car architecture uh, out of India, and uh, this is actually a very unique because most multinationals never 
never uh, go to the extent of uh, building an entire platform, you know, an architecture from the ground up in a developing country. They always do that in a rich country and close to their quarters, like in Paris or, you know, uh, or New York uh, kind of thing, or London. Uh, but this is the first time that they built literally an entire car architecture out of Chennai, right here, uh, close to us here. And uh, from that architecture, of course, uh, they produced the quid that came out uh, for a price point of, you know, close to uh, $4,000. And of course, at this point, you know, you might say, well, it's still a car and it's still kind of using fuel, right? But the beauty is that that's what from the mission is about. That sometimes you start with something like this as an underlying platform that first produces a kind of typical car. But then, once you have a platform, it becomes the basis for coming up with other kind of car models that may be more sustainable. For instance, uh, the engineer behind this, Rada Thurbe, after completing his mission in India, is now living in China, where he's developing now $8,000 electric vehicle, okay. using the same platform that is used by Quid. Okay. So this is how also you can begin to create frugal solutions that integrate affordability, simplicity, sustainability, and quality at the same time. Okay? So this is kind of how it began, you know, this idea of innovation, which was much more about, you know, Carlos Ghosn is a politician, so it are coming more from the engineering perspective. But then it evolved, and we actually helped evolve this concept to bring in, beyond the economic dimension, the social and the environmental dimensions. So that's why, you know, the way I define frugal innovation is more about doing better with less. And by better, I mean trying to create more economic and social and environmental value. Because so far, we have been obsessed about, you know, I mean, not everyone, but trying to what we call reduce our carbon footprint, right? We want to essentially do less harm to the planet. But I think where we are going next, especially with the, you know, need the value system of the next generation, uh, is to actually enlarge what we call our ecological handprint. That means not just doing less harm by you know, riding a bicycle instead of riding a car, for example, but how can we intentionally create positive ecological value? For example, can we build a factory, and it's already happening now in some companies that are saying, how do we build a factory that not only pollutes less, uses less water and electricity, but actually has solar panels that generate free electricity for 100 houses around us? Or through the manufacturing process, we create portable, drinkable water that can be supplied to local community. Right? So that's, what, that's why I put it here to say that it's important to create more positive ecological value uh, instead of just thinking about you know, minimizing our negative impact on the planet. By the, same, by the same token, we also have to try to minimize the scarce resources, whether it's you know, financial resources. In India, you know, it's still a developing country. We can, you know, we have to have a big outlay. We can afford a big outlay, you know, capital-wise. <laughs> To invest in big, you know, expensive projects. We have to be, you know, parsimonious in terms of using resource, financial resources, but also natural resources like water, which is getting scarce. Uh, I live in Silicon Valley. We have the, you know, highest uh, you know, GDP per capita, but we're also facing, you know, a depleting, you know, uh, water bed. And uh, so, natural resources like water are also going to become scarce. We have to minimize that. And then, sorry, and then of course the time dimension, right? Many of the issues I talked about, like climate change are becoming urgent issues. So time, the clock is ticking. We have to figure out a way not to find the solutions faster than you know, wasting time to come up with very complex solutions. So, and then it gets even more interesting because you see, if you start introducing an order of magnitude and you say, what if we can create a solution that delivers 10 times more value using 10 times fewer resources? It starts to get you know, quite interesting, right? Then you can push it even further and say, what if the solution delivers 100 times more value using 100 times fewer resources. Uh, now we are talking about really, you know, like a, a breakthrough kind of uh, solution. So let me give you one example of such solution. Today there are millions of babies that are born uh, prematurely around the world. Uh, many of them actually in poor countries where they die actually because they don't have access to what we call a baby incubator. And a baby incubator costs uh, on average in the West about $20,000 and requires electricity to operate. And in a country like India, you can imagine $20,000 is a lot of money, and uh, we don't always have electricity now accessible, available for us. So looking at this problem, uh, instead of saying, okay, so, you know, you have seen a baby incubator, right? It's designed in plexiglass. 
So instead of taking that as a reference point and trying to come up with a, you know, a, a smaller version of that, four students from uh, Stanford University in California came up with this very ingenious solution, which is called Embrace. Uh, so Embrace actually is, looks like, a, I brought it here, so it looks like a mini sleeping bag. And, uh, and it's designed essentially in such a way that inside you have uh, something that looks like this. So this is uh, called a phase change material. It's like wax. And uh, you can put it on a heating pad or in boiling water and it melts. And essentially you reinsert that inside. And then you can keep the baby at uh, constant temperature for six hours straight. And uh, this solution costs only uh, $200. So 1% of the cost of incubators. And designed entirely you know, out of emerging markets. So this one is designed you know, out of Bangalore here. And what is important is that it doesn't just cost less and uh, save babies' lives, which is important, but also it delivers greater emotional value. Because see, the mother can actually hold the baby against her. And we call the kangaroo care, right? And, and this is important because it does not only save the physical lives of the babies, but also contribute to the emotional well-being over time of the baby, thanks to this physical contact with their mother. And, uh, and this solution, of course, has uh, saved the lives of uh, nearly 300,000 babies already. And, uh, and the target is to save the lives of you know, 1 million babies in the next 10 years. Uh, and of course, Jane Chen, the, one of the co-founders, had the pleasure to meet Obama was a big fan of the solution and promoting you know, these kind of frugal solutions uh, from the White House. Of course, now things have radically changed, but I won't go there. Um, so, of course, then you can also think about what will happen if you push the envelope even further and you come up with a solution that delivers 100 times, 1,000 times, let's say, right? More value, something priceless. But at the same time, try to reduce the cost and use our resources by 1,000 times. Now we are talking about some kind of you know, superhuman kind of uh, solution. And uh, it is already available, such solutions. Uh, today there are thousands, if not millions, of kids worldwide uh, who don't have the hand, a single hand or both hands, uh, due to genetic reasons, or they are born in an accident, they lost their hands. And today, if you want to uh, equip them with a prosthesis, uh, a high-end uh, kind of industrial, uh, industrial uh, prosthesis, cost about $35,000. But uh, there is this NGO called uh, Enabling the Future, uh, which actually does something very clever. Um, they create these prosthesis, the design, using a computer, and then the design files are made open source. That means they are freely available for anyone. So let's say you know, your parents of such a child who doesn't have you know, her uh, hand, uh, you can actually download these files and use what we call a 3D printer. Uh, a three-dimensional printer to actually print uh, like a Lego blocks, the different parts of this uh, prosthesis, slap them together, and it becomes, you know, uh, a regular prosthesis that you can find elsewhere in the market. And uh, this solution costs only $35, which is one ten, one thousand times cheaper, you know, than existing, you know, high-end solutions. And this has brought a lot of joy to Maxence, who became uh, France's uh, six-year-old French kid became uh, the first French kid in, uh, in France to be equipped with a 3D printed uh, prosthesis. Okay? And uh, also brought a lot of joy to this uh, Indonesian woman, young mother, who was able to feed a newborn baby for the first time with her you know, own hands. So this is why I think that food innovation for me, beyond the economic and social dimension, it has a deep human dimension. It's really about how do we maximize joy in the world while minimizing suffering. So that is the kind of you know philosophical kind of uh, you know, spirit you know underlying this concept. So of course all these examples I gave so far are about specific products, specific technologies, which is you know very uh, kind of inspiring. But I think we need to kind of go one step further and boldly think about how do we use this kind of frugal mindset to maybe fundamentally rethink our economy and even our society. Uh, and here we spend you know last five years actually shifting gear and uh, take our focus away from poor countries and begin to see what's happening in richer countries. And, uh, and here we begin to see some interesting trend uh, where we notice that more and more, uh, and this is the book we wrote which came out uh, in 2015, where we examine a shift actually, a radical shift 
in the value systems of citizens as consumers, as employees. For example, there are more and more people, uh, young people particularly, that are becoming more conscious about the growing inequality. Uh, for example, you know, we think about India as having a lot of inequality, but it's happening, of course, in America. You have read about it. But even in, the, in Europe, right, when we think of being a more you know, equalitarian kind of society, it turns out that there are you know, 50 million people who live below the poverty line. That's like 16% of the population, right, which is kind of you know, economically you know, uh, in difficult condition. Um, and also, we're becoming more aware of the fact that they're rapidly depleting our natural resources. Uh, and this is creating more ecological awareness as well. Uh, the fact, for example, the, what we call the Earth Overshoot Day has been moving up in the year. Uh, this, is a, this is a date where in the year um, they say that you, know, you have used up all the, resor all the resources that Mother Earth can provide for that particular year. Uh, that means that essentially you're overshooting. That means you're consuming more than what Mother Earth can replenish in terms of giving you new resources and absorb your waste. So we are doing it faster than what the planet Earth can absorb and replenish. And uh, so this is, uh, think about this way, it's like having a paycheck, and uh, by the 20th of the month, you used up everything. So you have no more money left, and the next 10 days, you are living on debt. Right? And then eventually the creditor, in this case, not the bank, but Mother Earth, comes back knocking on the door and says it's time to pay back. And that's why we have all these you know, extreme climate you know, situations right, going on around the world. Uh, so people are becoming aware that there's an urgency to deal with, you know, this kind of resource scarcity and, uh, and planetary changes. And this is kind of beginning to translate into some, uh, as I said, a big shift in the values of some of these, uh, you know, consumers uh, in Europe particularly. For example, uh, there are more and more consumers who are saying they're comfortable they're buying like what we call uh, private labels. That means they're not attached to brands anymore, you know. They only want something which actually fulfills a particular kind of, you know, utilitarian value for them. Uh, and there's no more this kind of, you know, emotional attachment with brands, the premium brands, that is. Uh, and we also see that, you know, there is a growing movement among uh, young people uh, to say we want to live with less. And uh, that means that it's not that I have to live with less, but I choose to live with less. It's more like a, you know, a conscious choice to do so. And uh, this is something we call minimalism. Uh, other people call it, uh, you know, uh, simplicity volontaire, voluntary simplicity, for example. Uh, people choosing to live in a more, you know, a kind of more frugal lifestyle. And then you also see that more and more uh, consumers expect actually the brands, the product and services they buy, the companies from, are actually more socially and environmentally responsible. So they want them to be accountable for the kind of impact they have, you know, on society and the planet. And particularly, you see that among the generations uh, Y, which is the millennials, uh, as well as the next one coming up, the generation Z, have a very different kind of uh, perspective about life because they value uh, quality of life over quantity in life. And it translates into some interesting kind of data points. Like, for example, more young people want to share cars as opposed to own a car. Uh, for my generation, X, you know, car is a status symbol. So the bigger, the better. Uh, and uh, but I think the next generation has a very different rapport, you know, with uh, these uh, consumer products, and uh, they see the utility in terms of on demand as a service, as opposed to a, a physical product that they buy and own for life. But more interestingly, you see that many of these young people want to be entrepreneurs. They want to create some solutions for you know the economy or for the society, uh, as opposed to you know going and joining a large company and stay there you know, for life, which was the kind of expectation from, for our generation. So if you kind of take all this together, uh, what I begin to see is that we're assisting to the rise of what I like to call conscious citizens. And uh, of course, in the Western world, uh, the term conscious is very kind of reductionist and almost medical in connotation. Uh, so if you are conscious, that means that you're awake. And if you're unconscious, of course, that means you know you are asleep or you know you're in a coma, right? But of course, in uh, India, particularly, you know, we have developed a sophisticated understanding of consciousness, uh, particularly this whole science of consciousness, which is built on what we call the chakras. Uh, these are the energy centers, right, located in our subtle body, and there are several of seven of them, as you know. Uh, there are three that are the kind of the foundation. Uh, in the sense that uh, they kind of uh, are the energies that drive uh, emotions, strong emotions like fear or desire, uh, initially sexual desire, but it could be desire for more, 
uh, this need for always having more. And then once you have more, it's not enough. You want it, have it all. <laughs> uh, this is where the need for power and domination happens. Uh, this is really where the ego becomes, you know, goes into overdrive. And uh, as long as you live a life where your thoughts, emotions, actions are primarily driven by the energies of the lower chakras, essentially you leave a mode of existence, I like to call a having mode of existence. It's all about having because it's never enough what you have. So you always want to have more. And your identity and your character is defined completely by what you have. The material possessions, the titles, the fame, etc. you have. And because you always live with a sense of scarcity, something is missing inside you, there's a lack that you try to fulfill all the time by looking outside for, you know, for input. Uh, and you become also very self-centered. Uh, it's always about, you know, me, 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 my problems, my needs. Um, Dalai Lama famously says that the people who use the words I, me, mine in sentences very often are more prone to heart attacks <laughs> than the people actually who use, you know, we, us, ours. And scientifically, it has been proven as well. So that transition from the me-centric to we, in a way, as collectively, happens really with the opening of the heart chakra, right? Because that's really the anahata, which actually gives access to compassion, which is really the passion to, you know, uh, overcome, solve, help others solve their problems and alleviate their hunger. And of course, that's just the starting point. Uh, because, you know, in the West, we talk a lot about emotional intelligence, which is a very hot term right now. So after the IQ, it's about the EQ. Uh, but uh, in our perspective in India, well, that's just a starting point. Because then comes something more interesting, which is discovering your authentic self. Uh, the ingenuity, the Judah for me is here in the Vishuddhi, right? Which is really where the true self of who you are expresses itself in a very unique fashion. And, uh, and I always say that, you know, most of us are born with a unique song that we are uniquely qualified to sing. And most of us would die without ever discovering that song. And that song resides right here. But of course, once you discover your innate gifts and talents, you don't want to selfishly use them for your own you know, needs, but you're going to you know, operate in the spirit of seva, which is service. And this is where you have access to intuition that tells you how you can transcend your intellect and emotions and leverage these inner gifts you have to contribute to a larger purpose. And then, of course, then you have unity, you know, with this much more about finding the sense of oneness. So, so the whole kind of journey is to kind of go from the journey of division and uh, restlessness and the sense of lack to this, you know, sense of oneness, the sense of fullness, and the sense of stillness. And at that point, you start operating more in a being mode because you find that, you know, abundance within you. You feel rich inside. So you don't have to go plunder the earth to find the resources to fill this big gulf you feel inside. And because you're also the center, right? And more and more neuroscientists say that the more you care for others, people actually tend to live longer. <laughs> uh, and this is funny, right? All this now Western sciences are beginning to back it up. Uh, things that intuitively and you know, empirically we have known for a long time, now the Western sciences are beginning you know, to back it up as well. Um, and I believe that the more we become conscious as citizens, uh, especially in India, I believe that we have a unique ability or unique opportunity to actually start building a whole different economy. An economy that actually, whose development is not similar to that trajectory pursued by the West for 200 years that led us to, you know, all kind of, you know, fiasco we find ourselves today. And uh, this new economy, I like to call it a frugal economy. Uh, it's an economy that is powered by a different kind of energy. Let's call it human energy. And uh, this uh, frugal economy actually rests on three pillars, uh, which are about uh, sharing. So again, there is a collective aspect to it that links to different aspects of the energy I talked about. It's about sharing, which creates a sense of community. It's about making, where you use your ingenuity to create something as opposed to passively consuming. And this notion that, you know, we are not disconnected from nature. We are part of nature. So we are much more conscientious about how you use natural resources by reusing you know, resources again and again. So what I want to do essentially is to kind of uh, go through each of these pillars with some concrete examples. So I want to begin with the sharing, uh, which I think, as I said, is becoming a dominant feature uh, in many economies now. Uh, for example, car sharing has become more and more popular now. Uh, and uh, this is a French company called Blah Blah Car, which enables the ride sharing. And uh, two years ago, they had 20 million members. Now they have over 35 million members. 
and the fastest growing market is India. Uh, and uh, so car sharing is already happening, right? So apartment sharing, like sharing apartments in your houses with Airbnb, that's also happening. But what's interesting is, if you think about what would happen if you share resources, not only as consumers, but as organizations. What happens if different companies, different organizations start you know, sharing resources? And you can apply that, for example, in a sector that severely is suffering today, which is the agriculture sector. Right? Farmers, as you know, commit suicide, the water level is going down. So very difficult situation for the farmers. Uh, and looking at this, uh, Rotash Mal, who is an entrepreneur, uh, he was the former CEO of uh, Escort, which makes tractors here in India. And uh, in, uh, in his uh, 60s, he said, you know what, I want to have you know, a different kind of purpose now, which is to go back to the people I sold the tractors as an equipment and offer that as a service. That means that essentially it's a, this company called EM3 is like the Uber for farmers. So the idea is that if you're a farmer, you just press a button and somebody shows up in a tractor and says, I can help you harvest. So the idea is that instead of buying something and owning it as an asset, which is expensive, we can have access to this equipment on a pay-as-you-go basis, which makes it more affordable. Okay? And it's not just equipment. We can also have access to advisory services, like you know, which crops I should use, how can I increase my yield, my productivity, are there some techniques to use like drip irrigation, right? Because people, they don't know what they don't know, right? So with this, actually, they can access to a community of experts who can actually come to them same logic, right? As I said, if the doctor cannot go to the patient, the patient has to come to, you know, the doc, the, 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 if the patient cannot go to the doctor, the doctor has to come to the patient. And similarly, if the expertise, the farmer cannot access it, they have to figure out a way to bring the expertise to the farmer. Right? And this is where this kind of solution becomes very interesting, you know, to help the expertise reach out to these farmers who otherwise are not even aware of these kind of solutions. Um, and the second pillar is what we call making. Um, this actually reflects also a big shift in values. Uh, the old kind of motto as uh, citizens used to be, I consume, je consomme dans je suis. I consume, therefore I am. Uh, the, the kind of new motto that being embraced for the young people is, I create, therefore I am. That means that I don't want to be a passive user of other people's products. I want to actually create something. That means instead of going to IKEA to buy a chair, I want to build a chair myself. And this is becoming easier and easier thanks to a couple of things. I want to single out two of them. One is that more and more we have access now to highly affordable technologies. So I brought one of them right here, which is called a Raspberry Pi. So this is actually, it looks like this. You see, it's like a, the size of a credit card. And uh, this is a microcomputer, it's actually a computer, uh, the size of credit card, and it costs only $35. And uh, this has you know, a lot of memory, it has a very strong kind of microprocessor inside. And the idea was initially, this is developed in, uh, at Cambridge University to teach young people programming, computer programming. And the next thing they know, they have sold uh, 15 million units of this worldwide, uh, where this is being used to build all kind of interesting applications including applications, for example, in education. So on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see a fabulous example where um, this, you can download all the Wikipedia content, all the Khan Academy, which is basically an online site with uh, tutorials in science technology. You take all that content, put it inside, and then you, this becomes a local server. So in a classroom, you drop it on a table, and then the kids can use the Akash, you know, the low-cost tablet in, in rented in India, which is about $30. And then from their low-cost tablets, they can access the content inside, locally, without having to access the internet. So again, if the kids cannot access the knowledge, the knowledge has to come to the kids. Okay? So this is a solution that costs only $200. And what's more impressive is that this is the Akanksha Public School in Pune. And, uh, the kids self-assemble the solution in just two hours. No teachers involved. They start learning. Right? So this is also what's happening is that it's a less and less this kind of you know uh, more vertical learning approach, you know, top down and much more you know lateral way of learning you know in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. Uh, so that's the first thing happening. The kind of these uh, very affordable technologies that allow you now to build and make 
solutions, you know, in uh, healthcare education because you can also make cheap medical devices, right, with this kind of technology. So, uh, and then there are also what we call the maker spaces. Uh, this is actually from Mumbai, where I'm going right now tomorrow. I'll tell why I'm going there in a few minutes. But essentially, the maker spaces is actually a community lab. Uh, this is a space. This is a place equipped with uh, laser cutters. Uh, 3D printers uh, and tools like that, so that even if you don't know something, let's say you want, as I said, you don't want to buy a chair, I want actually to make a chair, but I'm not a carpenter. Well, you can actually go there, and there are a community, there's a community of people there who can, carpenters, let's say, who have a passion for carpentry, they can help you learn these skills. So within two weeks, you know, you acquire new skills, and you can actually make your own chair. So you have a different emotional attachment, you know, to the chair when you're using it at home, as opposed to you know buying it from you know IKEA or have it delivered by you know Amazon. And uh, of course, you know this can be used for all kind of products and services. Of course, for example, there are doctors uh, who want to become I call them Dr. MacGyver, you know. So they have this you know Jugadu spirit inside. So I saw a doctor who comes and is creating his own uh, ECG device, right? Uh, or an architect who comes and says I want to experiment with mud. So this is a place where you go from idea to a prototype in a matter of days. Because in India, we are very intellectual. We like a lot of ideas. But here is a way to go. And also, we criticize India of now. You guys are all about ideas, but you know, you're not practical. But this kind of uh, you know, debunks that. Uh, and you see a lot of young people actually learn by doing. So this is the other message, right? It's less and less top down and lateral, but also less and less about rote learning and more about you know, learn by doing because this is becoming the new classroom for teaching science, technology, engineering, what we call STEM, to kids in the future. And we'll come back to that uh, in a few minutes. So these are the kind of community labs, we call them, that are emerging around the world. Um, and uh, it goes one step further, because so far I talked about you know, frugal technologies, uh, frugal products. But uh, what if you can apply frugality now to science? So that essentially you can start making scientific discoveries on a shoestring. That becomes very really interesting, isn't it? So one of the pioneers of this movement called frugal science is uh, Manu Pragash, who is a professor at uh, Stanford University, who is actually coming up with the ultra affordable scientific devices. For example, today even the cheapest microscope costs two thousand dollars, and uh, he has created this uh, microscope called Foldscope which is designed like a paper origami that you can fold and it amplifies subcellular structures like you know viruses parasites you know for example you know, and it amplifies them so you can diagnose if someone has malaria or tb that was the original intent and uh, then the next thing they know of course this is being used to teach uh, science technology science and you know scientific subjects like chemistry in far remote places like this mazai tribe school in Kenya, okay, and uh, they are right now shipping one million units worldwide, okay? and these are used not only as a low-cost medical diagnostic tool, but also as a way to learn, as I say, scientific subjects, you know, like chemistry in a more hands-on fashion. And we have that also extended to the concept of the community lab, where you know this time I said it's about Manu Prakash creating right microscope and then sending to different people. What if you want to create? yourself the next microscope right? so this is the next level of innovation right where you, you know you innovate innovation meta innovation i call it right so here there are some interesting kind of uh, experiences going on like uh, this is a thomas Longla, a french biologist uh, who actually set up la payasse in paris uh, this is an open source community lab anyone can go there and actually do experimentation in um, life sciences like biochemistry or you know biotechnology and the only condition is that whatever you develop has to be open source. You can't, you know, protect the kind of invention you make there because you're taking advantage of the equipment and the kind of uh, expertise being offered generously to you. And uh, it started in this kind of very small decrepit kind of uh, uh, building for seven years. And then the mayor of Paris, Anne Hidalgo, gave him a larger space in the heart of Paris. Uh, because she's trying to promote what we call the notion of uh, citizen science. It means that anyone, any citizen now, can potentially be a scientist. Right? You don't need to have a PhD or an advanced degree to believe that you have to, you know, you need that to become a scientist. And uh, and with this kind of new space, they're able now to come up with some very interesting uh, technologies. 
One of them that just came out recently is uh, this uh, company that spin off called the Pili, which actually makes ink used for pens as well as uh, dyes used, you know, very polluting, right, for clothes out of bacteria. So instead of synthesizing, you know, chemicals, you know, that are polluting and whatnot, toxic, they actually literally grow bacteria in a petri dish. And that can be used, you know, as a, can be organic, uh, you know, ink or dyes, okay? So these are the kind of solutions coming out from these uh, community lab, laboratoire uh, communautaire, that are being set up now, you know, in major cities around the world. Uh, in Mumbai also, they are considering now bringing something like this, uh, so in Hyderabad and other cities. Um, and more importantly, this maker movement gets very interesting because it's not just about, you know, making a chair, as I said, you know, or go and, you know, and, and thinker in these uh, community labs. It's also about going from uh, the centralized production of electricity and uh, energy and uh, food to a more decentralized way of producing these basic goods and services. And this is already happening in the domain of energy, where in Europe, more and more, like in Germany particularly, neighborhoods have the capacity now to self-generate uh, their own heat and uh, using biomass and their own energy using solar, electric, solar panels. And uh, it's estimated that by 2050, 50% uh, 50 of the European households will be able to generate their own clean electricity. Okay. So you go from a consumer, as I said, to an active, you know, producer of, you know, these, uh, these basic services. And then finally, the, the third pillar to conclude is uh, the notion of reusing, as I said. This is the only country where we recycle, you know, a uh, repair plastic bucket. And, uh, and here also, as I said, the West, of course, always takes some interesting practices from uh, this part of the world and they come up with a new label. And uh, so in the last couple of years, this concept that has kind of really you now grown by leaps and bounds is something called the circular economy. And this is something that is becoming more and more popular, uh, particularly in Europe, which is you know very excited about this concept. And this is in contrast with the notion of a linear economy. Uh, because in a linear economy, what happens is that you extract raw materials from other earth, you make an iPhone, use it for a few years, and then you get rid of it. And the iPhone goes into a landfill, right? Which creates you know, more toxi toxicity and waste, etc. And the new approach with the circular economy, as it says, is that when you design the product itself, you think ahead and you say, what if at the end of the use of the product, I can collect the product, old product, and then recover all the materials inside and use them to make a new product? Uh, it could be, for example, the carpet, the two largest carpet companies. Carpet, by the way, is very toxic. We don't realize that. Toxic means of you know, indoor pollution, but also uses a lot of toxic materials and hardly being recycled. So the two largest carpet companies in the world, uh, Interface and Taquette, which is a French company, are now some of the early pioneers of this concept. So that uh, at the end of the use, 10 years later, they come and collect the carpet, and 99% of the content can be recovered and recycled. So this is, you know, the notion of circular economy that has been estimated can add, you know, five thousand, five trillion dollar, you know, to the global economy and create new jobs that don't exist there in the space. And uh, this has led to uh, interesting inventions like uh, Levi Strauss, Levi's the jeans maker. Uh, they actually use uh, recycled plastic. As you know, the oceans are infected uh, of, uh, with uh, plastic that is floating, right? Uh, and they actually collect these, uh, you know, plastic bottles, and they use eight uh, recycled plastic bottles to make a pair of jeans under this collection called Wasteless. So again, the idea is like, you know, as an alchemist, you know, how do you turn waste into something, you know, which is valuable? And uh, similarly, next time we have a filter coffee here in the south, uh, don't throw away the waste uh, because out of the coffee waste, you can create at least 50 different products, uh, natural cosmetics. Uh, organic fertilizers, pellets for you know for cooking, etc. And there are many startups now who are actually specialized in reusing you know coffee waste uh, to make new products. Um, and of course, uh, it's not just about recycling, reusing waste, uh, because that could seem again like an economic you know efficiency kind of game. It's also about how every time you recycle, you can also create more social value. And uh, here, I uh, invite you to look at uh, this documentary called Dharavi Diary, which actually shows how in Dharavi, which is Asia's uh, largest slum in Mumbai, 
Uh, they're actually training uh, young women uh, to actually learn to sew and uh, different craftsmanship so they can actually collect, uh, use the waste, uh, waste materials to actually make beautiful items. Uh, and this is what we call upcycling as opposed to, you know, just recycling because we're trying to create more aesthetic, we're adding more aesthetic value, right, to waste as well and make it more aspirational. And uh, so this is the, you know, the third pillar, which is about, you know, reusing and recycling. So I want to uh, conclude now with the final section, which is, you know, this is what's happening around the world, but I want to bring it back now to you as, um, as citizens. Think about how can you now, each of you, use food innovation to co-build a better world. And uh, here I think I want to begin by stating uh, what Gandhiji said is that it's important that we live simply so others may simply live. So we have to adopt a frugal lifestyle. We are 7 billion on planet, and if we keep consuming the way we are consuming, uh, we are going to need 2.5 planets to sustain us in terms of resource supply and absorption of the waste by 2030. And we already have only half planet left. <laughs> so clearly we have to you know, live better with less. Uh, so I think that kind of frugality has to be embedded in our lifestyle moving forward. Uh, I also invite you to see how we can each raise our consciousness so we can think and act more consciously uh, as uh, consumers, as uh, employees, and as citizens. Um, and I think with that, we may be able to build this uh, frugal economy that, as I said, rests on these three pillars of sharing, making, and uh, reusing. And uh, having said all of that, you know, I am also, uh, as you know, dealing with uh, navigating three cultures. I'm Indian, I'm French, I'm American. And for a long time, we used to talk about, you know, the first world problem and the third world problems. Uh, when I was studying in Lycée Francais, it was actually worse back then. We used to talk about, you know, the société civilisée, non-civilisée. It wasn't even developed versus non-developed. It was the civilized versus non-civilized, you know, uh, societies. We have come a long way from there. Uh, but still, we are creating a contrast between the first world and the third world. And I think that when you look at more and more what's happening is that I believe that we're entering what I call the age of convergence. That means that more and more problems that we use to kind of uh, categorize and label as the first world or third world problems are actually becoming common problems shared by humanity. Like, for example, the case of uh, water, which actually, you know, aff afflicts everybody, right? It doesn't matter whether you are rich, poor, you know, black, white, you know, man, woman. More and more you can see that in you know, many southern countries, from the southern hemisphere will be affected, right? They are facing high stress, water stress. But as I said, even in uh, California and other California where I live, this is going to be a big issue going forward. Um, so I think that essentially we have to think more and more about what I like to call these uh, problems without borders that afflict all of us. And as I said, if you look at all the water you take on Earth and you model it as a sphere, this is what it looks like. And if you take all the drinkable water and you try to look, model it as, that's the little droplet you see. This is all we have left for 7 billion people. So you can imagine what we have 10 billion people by 2050, you know, we really have to learn right, to do more with us. But more importantly, you can see that with this image, this is a global problem. <laughs> this is not anymore an American problem, right, or Indian problem. This is humanity's problem. So we need to have ownership of this problem that, you know, is affecting all of us. And the same thing with the, chronic diseases, what we call the rich man's diseases, right? Diabetes, uh, you know, heart diseases that, you know, we used to associate with rich countries. And now, we are kind of exporting morbidity, as somebody said, you know, to the developing world. And, uh, and you can see that, you know, in the next coming years, some of the, you know, highest growth of chronic conditions will happen in poor countries, which already are strained in terms of, you know, healthcare services and healthcare delivery. Um, so these are problems that are converging. So if that's the case, what I think we have to think about is essentially, if the problems are converging, we also have to make the solutions to converge. We need to start what I call co-creating solutions. We can no longer say this is my problem, so I'm going to create my solutions here. That's your problem. You know, you do your stuff in your in your corner. We need to join forces now. And uh, and so this image is simply to show that essentially India has a potential. Of course, there's potential, but I believe in this potential to be this kind of place where we could integrate the best capabilities and ideas and talent from rich countries and from emerging countries and co-develop solutions that could have a global impact. 
Uh, and this is kind of my vision, right? To think about how can India become a centre de co-creation, a place where co-creation can happen. And uh, I'm thrilled to say that I'm part of two initiatives where we are trying to do this, uh, one in Africa, one in India. Uh, let me tell you about the African one. Uh, this is called Africa for Tech. Uh, and the idea here is to bring together entrepreneurs from Africa and uh, Europe uh, to actually co-create frugal solutions that will have class, of course, typically, uh, of course, a very big impact for African nations, but also could have an immense potential to address major issues in healthcare, energy, education, transportation for the developed world as well. And, uh, and I like the tagline, right? It's about globalizing the African innovation and Africanizing the new innovation. The second project, and this is why I said I'm heading to uh, Mumbai, uh, this is uh, happening under the auspices of the French Embassy and as part of uh, Bonjour India, the festival going on. Uh, this is actually the Makers Asylum in uh, Mumbai, where we are bringing together 100 students from France and India, or oh, they're doing it right now, over a 10 day period, like a hackathon, where they're going to co-create uh, solutions to address the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. So they're going to pick one or two of these SDGs, it could be water, it could be energy, and then they're going to create some uh, you know, work, working prototypes uh, that then the French and Indian government will figure out how can we scale them up. Um, and I think this is a, a fantastic initiative because you know, we have this uh, generation of students now who think much more globally, have much more global consciousness, and uh, it's also a fantastic way for them to get interested in what we call STEAM, which is science, technology, engineering, arts. It's not all about you know, technology and science, it's also about art, and then finally mathematics. And uh, so the idea is the same, learn by doing. So by getting the kids to actually get involved in uh, co-creating solutions you know, that address the major problems of you know, facing humanity today, it's also for them to learn these basics about you know, science technology instead of sitting in the classroom. Uh, so this is something that is happening right now, and I'm part of the jury that on Friday will you know, award you know, like a prize for uh, the three top you know, kind of projects that have been you know, co-created by the French and Indian students. So with that, I want to really uh, thank uh, your attention, and uh, I think we'll have time now for a couple of the questions. So thank you very much. Merci infiniment.